a javelin throwing machine. My name is Jeff Gorski and I am the coach of Club Kihas and we're putting this video together hopefully to make you a better javelin thrower or make you a better javelin coach. Uh, a little bit of an introduction. Uh, as an athlete I was a three-time finalist in the national championships and made a couple of uh, U.S. national teams had a lifetime best of just under 260 feet with the old rules javelin and thrown about 230 feet with the new rules javelin at an age of 30. Uh, I have been a coach at the University of North Carolina for eight years uh, and coached seven All-American athletes there. And since I started Club Key House five years ago, I have coached a number of very good javelin throwers, three national champions, uh, as well as Tom Puxtis, who is the current American record holder, and Linda Lipson, who is the current U.S. national champion, uh, as well as various high school athletes. The reason I'm putting this video together is for a couple of things. Javelin throw has always been something that's been very close to my heart, gave me a great education in major school, and I've always loved the sport, and it's now an opportunity to try to give something back and reach more people than I can just speaking at camps and clinics. I also want to get more coaches to understand the event so they can produce more good javelin throwers in this country than we have over the last number of years. We have a lot of talented athletes, but they don't have access to a lot of good information. So hopefully this video will help if they're coaching themselves, or if mom and dad are helping them out, or if you are a coach and you're trying to learn more about this event so that your athletes can score points, get you better placements in your conference meets, get you better performances at various levels with your athletes, hopefully this will enable you to achieve those goals as well. The biggest thing that I'm trying to do is get you to understand how you get your javelin throwers to throw far. What makes long throws happen? There are a couple of things that are involved in this and we will talk about these as time goes on through this video. The most important thing for throwing the javelin far is having a high release speed. The faster the javelin leaves your hand, the farther the throw is going to go. So all of your training has to be geared toward achieving a maximum release velocity. The fastest you can get the thing moving out of your hand is what's going to make it go the farthest. So that's got to be the total focus of your training. You don't want to get caught up in other aspects of training and forget about the main goal, which is to get you to throw farther or to get your athlete to throw the javelin far. So you want to train to throw far is the most important thing. The next thing you want to try to do is make sure that you train intelligently so that you stay healthy. An injured javelin thrower is not going to be able to throw very far and not going to be able to throw very often. So it's a, a bad situation. You want to make sure that you stay healthy. If you're healthy, you can train on a regular basis. Regular training gives you consistent improvement in technique and gives you a consistent improvement in your performances. So you want to stay healthy and we're going to show you how correct training and working on the right things can also keep you a healthy, more impressive thrower with a longer career. The last thing that we're going to address in the overall big picture of this is giving the athlete and you as a coach the mental imagery, the visualization, the idea that you're trying to get across so that you can give your athlete a concept or if you are the javelin thrower you understand what you're trying to achieve so there will be a lot of analogies a lot of mental pictures that we'll try to get across try to give you the information and the ideas that you need that are going to help you become a longer thrower so the first thing that we're going to talk about here in our little classroom such as it is is the actual mechanics of throwing the javelin what is going to make you throw the javelin far. These are things that we want to talk about initially. Most of the time when we're talking about the mechanics of any kind of a sport, whether it's hitting a golf ball, throwing a baseball, or throwing a javelin, we're going to try to work from the big muscles to the smaller muscles, from slow to fast. When we're talking about throwing the javelin and we're working on throwing from the ground up, working from your bigger, slower muscle groups up into your much weaker but faster moving muscle groups. This is where we're talking about developing a whip or developing a sling. 
The idea being that you want to stabilize and be firm and solid on one side of your body so that you can accelerate and whip the javelin with your throwing side around this solid base, this solid block. That's the actual throwing movements when you incorporate this whole idea into your run-up and the actual throwing technique, you have to, depending on what level of thrower you are and how experienced you are, whatever length your run-up and approach run is, has to be a smooth, continual acceleration so that when you hit your plant, that sudden jolt really accelerates your throwing side. So it's a sudden, very abrupt stop that accelerates the throw. This is not something that you're going to be able to do at a very fast speed right from the beginning. You're going to have to throw at a level where you can do your movements correctly, do a lot of repetitions of those movements correctly so that you can be very relaxed with it, and then you will try to go a little bit faster. As you go a little faster, you have to learn to relax again so that you can be comfortable, and then you try to go a little bit faster. So it's an ongoing cycle of doing the reps correctly, learning to be able to relax so that these correct movements happen, and then going a little faster and repeating the whole cycle. So that's what we'll work on when we talk about the mechanics of the throw. Another area that we're going to cover in this video are fairly common mistakes that happen when you're throwing the javelin that take away from the distance that you throw and that it can also lead to injuries. One of the biggest problems that people have is rushing their upper body into the throw much too early. So they have the tendency on the throw to be falling away from the throw or dumping down on the throw or pulling down on the tail of the javelin and stalling out the nose. That's one of the biggest problems that you'll have. Part of that sometimes comes from being too fast too early in the run-up so that instead of accelerating smoothly into the throw, you're going too fast and then you have to actually slow down to get in control of your movements so that you can actually try to deliver the javelin correctly. But by that time, your upper body is caught up to your lower body and again, you're dumping down, you're falling away from the delivery on the throw. Another part of this, and you will find when we explain this more, that a lot of these mistakes all pretty much come together from one basic source. Uh, another problem that you've already seen me demonstrate is how this left shoulder for a right-handed thrower falls away to the left side and you dip and you dump away from the throw. That is also a problem that sometimes comes from being too fast too early or rushing your upper body into the throw or it could be a result of the last thing that's one of the most common mistakes is landing too hard on, the, on your right leg on the crossover so that when you land there's a jolt and everything settles and falls away on the throw as well. Those are aspects that we will talk about in the section on common mistakes in throwing the javelin uh, and you will see when we discuss these later on in the video that these are usually always associated with one or two main mistakes in your throwing technique or your approach technique. These are things that you will see happen very commonly to most throwers during the course of their career at some level or another. Okay, what we want to talk about now in determining where long throws come from and how do you get to throw the javelin far. In throwing the javelin or the discus or just about anything that's being thrown for distance or for speed, there are three aspects, there are three things that come into play. The first and by far the most important is the release speed, the velocity. How fast something is moving when it leaves your hand determines how fast and how far it's going to go. So that is very, very important trying to achieve a high release speed. The second thing that's not as important but you still have a good deal of control over is the angle of the release. What the angle of what you're throwing is in, relation to, in relationship to the ground. The flatter the angle, the farther you're going to throw if you have a very, very, very high release speed. If you don't have a real high release velocity, then your angle has to be a little bit steeper so that you get more air under the implement. The angle of your release 
is determined by how good you are with your technique and how fast you have the implement leaving your hand. The third thing that determines on how far you throw something that you have some control over but not nearly as much as the release velocity which is the most important and what you have the most control over and the angle of the release which is the second most important and you have again some degree of control over that. The third thing that is important is the actual height of release. How far what you're throwing is from the ground. What we end releasing the javelin as far off the ground as possible. When we're talking about achieving a maximum release velocity, getting the javelin out of your hand as fast as possible, the only way to really do that effectively and consistently is you have to anchor against a solid left side for a right-handed thrower. You have to have a really firm block in order to accelerate your throwing side around it. If this is not firm, then you start falling into the problems that we talked about briefly on the mistakes where the shoulder drifts away or you're dumping forward at the release rather than coming in and being very firm, very tall as you deliver the javelin going out in front of your plant foot. So you have to develop a solid block on the left side. A lot of that is going to come from having a smooth acceleration in your run up and a very aggressive sweeping of the feet into your delivery position off of your crossover so that that foot is out in front of you waiting for the ground and being very active in pulling this left arm into your side at the same time you're letting your body weight rush into the solid left leg. So literally when the left foot hits the ground you are imagining a solid post from your left foot all the way up the line all the way up this nice straight line to your left shoulder and then from that jolt this is where you're going to anchor the whip of the javelin around. If there's any break in this line it's going to take away from the speed of the release and consequently you're not going to throw the javelin as far. So you really have to train early and often to anchor the release against a very solid left side for right-handed throw. You really have to stress working on being firm with that and the timing of the left arm being done with its action when the left foot hits the ground is extremely important. If the left arm is too late when the left foot hits the ground, the speed of rotating the upper body that comes from the sudden stop of the legs is going to make you fall away from the throw. If this shoulder is still moving, while the leg block is rushing your upper body forward so you have this rotary component combined with this vertical component then the delivery position goes out here which is going to cause you to have a poor release speed and as you can see arm and shoulder problems most likely rather than being in a very good appropriate position of landing in here where now you can see I have a very solid base to accelerate the javelin around and all the force from my run up has a much better chance of being channeled into the javelin into a fast delivery rather than me wasting energy falling away and trying to stay tall and fighting against gravity while I'm still trying to put speed into the javelin. It's not very effective. It's certainly an easy way to get injured. What you would need to do, as you can see, this is not a real natural position to throw from. This is not something that comes very easily for a lot of people. There are people with a great throwing arm, and that great throwing arm is generally a natural ability to block the non-throwing shoulder and whip around it. But to be able to do it in a total body action where you come in and you cross over and plant and jolt and whip using your entire body, it's a very difficult skill to become proficient at. So you have to do a lot of throws. There's a lot of repetitions to first learn how the skill is achieved. And then secondly, you do a lot of repetitions so that you become relaxed and natural with the movement. The whole idea of getting a fast release speed comes from the muscles having a very 
stretchy, elastic quality to it. There's a, very much of a stretch reflex or loading up a bow and then releasing. You have to be relaxed in order for the muscles to stretch like that. If you're not, then the muscles are tense and you lose that elasticity. So you have to throw a lot, you have to take a lot of repetitions so that this is a natural movement that you can be relaxed at doing and then you achieve a much more elastic action of the muscles and then that will result in a higher release speed. What is a lot of repetitions varies from person to person. For some person, that may be 20 throws in a workout. For another person, it may be 60 throws in a workout. That will vary from person to person. You as an athlete or you as a coach have to know what works best in terms of that workload. The next thing that we want to talk about is in order to throw the javelin far, you have to train specifically to throw the javelin far. Uh, a lot of times it's very easy to get caught up in the supplemental parts of training, getting stronger in the weight room, which is important, getting faster in sprinting, which is important, being able to jump more explosively, more powerfully. These are all important components that added together make you throw the javelin farther, but it's very easy to sometimes get caught up in the actual training you get so caught up in the weight room with getting stronger, lifting more weight, moving more tonnage, that you forget that the reason why you are lifting is so that you can be able to put more power into throwing this thing farther. It's not who can lift the most weight in the weight room. If you want to be a weightlifter, by all means be a weightlifter. But don't forget the ultimate goal in your training is to be able to throw the javelin farther. Same thing in your running training, same thing in your jumping training, and the various other training aspects that we'll talk about in this video. Ultimately, it all has to be geared to learning how to throw this thing farther. So you have to make sure that all the training meshes and carries over and works together to make you channel your energy, channel your physical improvements into the javelin, and make this thing fly farther. So when you get into your more specific training, you have to not lose sight of that goal. In general, with a younger, inexperienced thrower, you're going to have to spend a fair amount of time in just improving the general physical condition, and at the same time, you have to spend a lot of time actually learning throwing techniques. So there's got to be kind of a balance between the two. As you become more proficient in your javelin technique, as you learn to throw farther, there are going to be some aspects of general conditioning and general training that are going to decrease in importance and decrease in volume. There's going to be another aspect of your training, the more specific training, that is going to increase. The things that have a direct high correlation to improving these performances in training will improve your performance in the distance thrown. Those things will also change. So there's always a balancing in the relationship between general training, specific training, and they all come together and mesh into your throwing technique and throwing the javelin farther. So there's a lot of aspects that come into play there that we will discuss in a lot more detail later on in this video. The next aspect that is very important in throwing far in the javelin is the, the mental or psychological aspects in throwing. Uh, the visual images, the, the mental practices that you go through are an area that a lot of times are overlooked by coaches uh, and sometimes athletes have their own little rituals or routines that they use that help them throw farther, but a lot of times there's no real substance or, or real rhythm or a, a, a reason to what they're trying to do. The mental aspects of your training are as important and in some cases even more important than the physical aspects. Obviously the most important mental aspect in your training is there has to be a commitment to being as good as you can be in the event. That's kind of obvious. The second thing that also seems obvious but a lot of times gets overlooked is you have to have a concept, you have to have an understanding, you have to have a picture of what your throwing technique, what your throws look like. A lot of times, athletes don't have a clue. They see themselves on film or on video, 
and they don't even know what they look like and how their throw looks. So you have to have a concept, at least generally, of what you're trying to do in your throwing technique. You also have to be able to address individual and smaller components of your throwing technique in a mental aspect, again in visualization, in mental practice, uh, as well as having some helpful hints or tricks or mental pictures that allow you to get into a very good throwing technique, throwing positions. For example, something that I like to talk about in throwing the javelin is the idea of a triangle. I like to think of, for a right-handed thrower, having a triangle that goes from the right hip to the left shoulder. This line is the base of your triangle, and the point of the triangle, depending on how good you are with your technique and how experienced you are, the point of that triangle is either the throwing shoulder, maybe to the throwing elbow, or actually to the throwing hand, so that in your technique, when you take your run up and land and throw, you want to have the mental picture of the base of that triangle getting as far ahead of the point of that triangle as possible. So you're trying to drag the point of the triangle or make the triangle face the sky. But some idea of the base, this line from right hip to left shoulder, getting very far ahead of the point very quickly and then you hold that and let the point of the triangle whip around that base. A very easy way to show that is to actually throw something. You know, I can demonstrate this with rocks rather than throwing the javelin where I come in and just watch how the effort is to get the base of the triangle ahead of the point and whip the point around the base. Okay? You're moving to let the base get ahead and whipping the point, whether that point is the shoulder, the elbow, the throwing hand. One more time to see moving the base actively and then let the point follow around. Okay? There's a lot of different mental aspects that we will also talk about later on in the video when we get to those areas. Now, I want to talk about the actual mechanics of throwing the jab. Okay? We're talking about the basic rudiments of technique here. We have to understand and we have to learn and realize that there are some basic things that have to happen in throwing the javelin no matter what the individual's style may be. And that's exactly what it comes down to is style. I've seen over the years a lot of different throwers try to copy or imitate another thrower's technique. And while imitation is called the most sincere form of flattery, I've heard a lot of great coaches and great athletes say that imitating somebody's technique is simply copying their mistakes. You have to understand what it is that makes the javelin fly far. There are four or five basic principles that have to take place for the javelin to fly far. And how you incorporate those into your personal style is going to be determined by your physical makeup, your strong points and weak points in your physical makeup, and how adept you are at applying your technique in certain ways. We've already talked about the need to accelerate into a solid block, into a solid plant, so that you can get a maximum release velocity. So acceleration through the throw, where you're moving your fastest right when you hit your block is one of the key things, one of the important constants that we can list in throwing the jab. The second that is equally as important is throwing off of a solid base, having a solid anchor in order to whip around. The third thing that is extremely important is you have to have an uninterrupted flow of momentum, an uninterrupted flow of energy of your center of gravity, of your hips, of your torso, into that solid block. That is often facilitated by the action of the right leg during the crossover and how it lands off the crossover. When you land on that right leg after the crossover, this leg has to actively give way. The knee has to drop. 
the heel has to come up, the foot has to turn, some idea of this leg kind of actively dropping out of the way to allow the hips to pass and flow smoothly into that sudden block so that the jolt and the sudden stop of the hips accelerates the upper body and delays the throwing shoulder so that that strikes after the body is stabilized, which is the next point. There has to be a delay in the strike of the arm, the strike of the throwing shoulder, and it has to all be applied around a good solid vertical base. So those are really the five basic principles that have to happen to throw the javelin far, no matter what style, no matter what individual quirks you may put into your throwing technique to suit your own physical capabilities. You have to accelerate, you have to have a solid block, you have to accelerate your hips into the block, there has to be a delayed arm strike, and there has to be a solid base to accelerate and whip that delayed arm strike around, okay? Now, when we're talking about the actual mechanics of the throw, you generally want to work like you build a house. You work from the ground up. The emphasis on the part on the throw begins with the action of the legs. We talked about the action of the right leg in the crossover, how it gets out of the way to allow the hips to flow into the solid blocking side. You have to have very quick and active legs to achieve a backward lean and initiate the delay in this throwing arm so that it stays back while the body moves through. So you have to be quick with your feet, but the speed of the throw works from the ground up. So as you run into the throw, as you take the crossover into the plant, the first movement is the running and the shifting of the legs. The legs do their work, they stabilize and allow the momentum and energy to flow up into the body. So now the hips and belly and chest turn into the throw as this left arm is pulled in tight to the side. Again, from the ground up. Now that the belly and shoulder are stable, now the chest and throwing shoulder start to rotate into place and then ultimately the javelin is struck. So you're working feet, legs, hips, belly, chest, shoulder, arms, javelin in a cracking the whip type of action. A ground up snap effect that you can see through that action or when again throwing a stone. Throwing anything you will see this whip crack delay action in the throw where it comes legs, arch, whip. And I can't stress the idea enough that the delivery of the arm, the action of the arm releasing the javelin is not a throw. It is not like throwing a baseball or throwing a football because those actions are a short restricted range of motion around the upper body only, whereas throwing the javelin is a cumulative loading effect a great deal of stretch reflexes in a lot of different muscle groups that culminate in a long accelerated whip that is very unlike an, a, an American throwing action. So I have to stress the point that you whip the javelin, you sling the javelin, you don't actually throw it. And this is applied around that solid base. So you have to have an anchor in order to whip around. The acceleration through the run-up and into the crossover steps, however many they are according to your technique, and into that solid block, into that plant, has to be a smooth, gradual, steady acceleration so that the idea, one that I like to teach with, is that you are actually running away from the javelin. Once you drop the javelin back, every step is quicker, 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 quicker than the one before. So every step moves you a little further ahead of the javelin, gives you a little bit more backward lean, so that when you ultimately hit your plant, there is the maximum distance from your left foot 
to your right hand that you can possibly achieve so that you're pulling the javelin over as long a distance and applying force and applying speed over as long a path as there is possible. In order to achieve that greatest, longest pull, when you hit that block and you hit that left foot with your right hand well back, that left side has to stop completely and suddenly so that the actual jolt of that left side finishes stretching and contorting the body to put more stretch on the muscles before you actually deliver the jab. Uh, a very nice way to think about it, especially with young throwers, is to imagine planting with the left side of your body facing the throw. A mistake that I see a great many javelin throwers of all ages and all levels of experience make is that when they come in and land on their plant on the throw, I've seen a lot of javelin throwers who try to plant square to the throw so that their chest and hips are already facing the throw when they hit their plant leg, their idea being that they're going to hit this position and hold it and then they will strike into the jab. While that's a very nice mental image, in actuality, that's not something that's going to happen because as soon as you hit the sudden plant, as soon as you hit that left side and you're solid with it, you are going to get an acceleration up and you're also going to get a rotation around. While these are rotations that can help the throw if they're applied properly, they can also take a lot away from the throw if you do them at the wrong time in the wrong place. When you land square to the throw, let me get a little bit of an angle here. If I land square to the throw when I hit the jolt, now the plant is going to rotate me up which is possibly okay, but it's also going to rotate me to the left, which definitely is not okay because now I'm falling away from the throw. So if I come into the throw and I land square, the chances are I'm going to throw from here. And that's not going to give you a good release velocity. You're going to have a very unstable base and very poor balance to deliver from. The idea of planting with your left side facing the throw takes advantage of the rotation up and the rotation around to put you into a good position to deliver the javelin and apply more speed to the javelin. Simply because as I come into the throw and I land this way and now I'm planted almost sideways facing the direction of the throw, this jolt, yes it's going to stand me up but it's also going to square me into the throw. So when I'm actually delivering the javelin I'm square and stable and all that's happening, I'm accelerating the point of the triangle is being accelerated into the release. And I'm tall and I'm balanced and I'm solid. I'm not falling away from the throw. That's something that I've played with as an athlete. I've worked with, with a lot of the athletes that I'm coaching and found this to be a very, very good idea. It's a very easy concept for the athletes to visualize and grasp. It gives them the opportunity to keep their balance and keep being aggressive, moving into the direction of the throw rather than trying to artificially square themselves and still maintain speed. A lot of bad things can happen when you try to change body alignment and body position while you're trying to run and accelerate into the throw keeping it very simple that you're already, when you're running with a javelin, you're already turned somewhat sideways and through your crossovers you're maintaining something of a sideways action in your run. If you can just maintain that sideways position when you plant to throw, now the upward rotation and the rotary action continue to put speed into the javelin and put you in a very nice position to deliver the throw and get a lot of speed and power into the delivery and you get a lot more distance that way. It's a very easy concept and it makes it easy to incorporate the mental image of planting the base of the triangle ahead of the point and whipping the point around it. It gives you a very concrete feel of posting up your left side and whipping your release around it. They're all good ways to reinforce 
the mental images that you're trying to achieve, the mental image and the visualization that's giving you that picture that you're trying to imitate when you're actually doing the throw. So the acceleration into that sudden stop allows you to rotate and accelerate and stretch more big muscles that apply more force into the javelin. When you are moving smoothly, keeping your hips moving in an uninterrupted path, and you hit that sudden stop of your plant, your plant should almost be a surprise. If you do it properly, if you do it well, you sh it should almost be, uh, you can't prepare for it. If you're preparing for it, then that means you're slowing down. You're not accelerating into your plant you're gathering and then bad things will happen from that positioning as well. Now what we've talked about, the mechanics of your throw you can see can sometimes get a little bit complicated. They may be a little bit confusing. More than anything, we're talking about some fairly unnatural actions again. And we go back to the need for repetitions of the skill so that it becomes more natural, that you're more comfortable with it because the idea of your technique is to get into a position where you achieve the most stretch reflexes in the largest number of muscle groups possible to allow the javelin release to be a reaction to this aggressive stopping. It's a reaction, a loading of the muscles, and a violent contraction that you don't have control over. You can, for an example, when you go into the doctor's office and they that sit you up on the table and the doctor whacks you on the knee with a hammer and your leg jolts out. That is not a voluntary action. That's a reaction. That's very quick. It happens very fast. It happens much faster than if you try to voluntarily kick your foot out. It never happens as fast as the reaction of being hit. This is the same idea that we're trying to do here is put the muscles on stretch from the sudden stop and when they are stretched like an elastic band, they contract much faster when they're stretched violently and then they contract violently than if you voluntarily try to contract them and make you throw fall. You'll have a much higher release speed if you come into your plant and jolt and stretch and the throw is a reaction than if you come in and you voluntarily load up the muscles and try to throw it fast. So we're trying to achieve that maximum stretching effect, that maximum elastic effect in the muscles, and you can't get that much stretch and explosive contraction unless the muscles are relaxed. And the only way the muscles can be relaxed is if you are comfortable and natural with the technique that you're using so that you can achieve these positions without undue tension in the muscles. So there has to be a cycle of learn the skill, do a lot of repetitions of the skill till it becomes comfortable. When it becomes comfortable and you're relaxed with it, then you try to do it a little bit faster so that you have to learn to be relaxed while you're moving at a quicker tempo, at a quicker pace, and then when you can do it relaxed at a faster speed, you're able to achieve a greater stretch reflex because now you're stopping more force. The more force that you stop suddenly, the greater the stretch in the muscles is going to be the more explosive and the faster the delivery speed is going to be. So there's a constant cycle in learning the skill, doing it faster, getting comfortable with that skill. When you reach a level of comfort, you get faster with it. And then you have to get comfortable at a faster speed. And then when you become comfortable, you go a little faster. And you're gradually always adding speed or comfort or relaxation into the cycle. And it's essentially never-ending. There are other variables that come into play, but essentially you're always trying to increase the speed of the technique so that you can get a greater stretch reflex that allows for a higher release speed, and a higher release speed is going to give you a farther throw. The one major mistake that you can make in this is trying to go too fast too early. If you try to go faster than you're ready for technically, that's when you run into problems the biggest one being that your upper body gets ahead of your feet and you start hitting your plant in this position and you're dumping away or you're falling off to the left or you're buckling and generally that's going to make you pull down on the tail of the javelin on release and give you bad flight and bad distances. One of the biggest mistakes that you can make in your throwing technique is to start running 
too fast, too early. A very simple way to think about your run-up speed and your javelin technique is that the approach run while you're carrying the javelin is simply a way to build up some momentum so that when you drop the javelin back, now you can start to accelerate and the tempo of the throw increases where every step is quicker than the one before. It's like a boulder rolling downhill. It's faster and faster and faster until you hit that sudden stop. But if you start going too fast, too early in the throw, you get out of control and you have to slow down to allow your body to get into position. And then when you slow down, the upper body catches up to the feet. When you finally hit the plant, you dump forward or you fall to the left, you're off balance and you're taking speed away from the jab. What we're going to go next into on the videotape is we're going to look at uh, some different drills, some different exercises to teach some of the phases of the mechanics of the throw. There are going to be some running drills, there are going to be some throwing drills with medicine balls, with javelin balls, different weighted balls, and the actual javelins themselves. So the next thing that we'll look at are drills and exercises to start to learn good basic javelin technical mechanics. The throwing events, the speed of release is the most important thing in determining how far you're going to throw. So when you're teaching javelin technique, what you're trying to do is find a way to get this person to get as much speed as they possibly can into the javelin at the point of release. I've found through the years that the best way to do that is to really pay attention to having a solid plant side. If right-handed thrower is going to be a solid left side, as early as possible in the throw and holding that side firm as you deliver the jab. So what we're going to do is work on, I'm going to show you a couple of different drills and just basically go through basics and throwing from stand and with a couple of steps to teach the proper idea of coming into the throw. I really like the idea. I found that it's very helpful in teaching to really think about planting the left side in the direction of the throw and then let the plant, let the block square you up into the delivery. I think it's a big mistake to try to teach throwers to land on their plant square to the throw because as soon as you stop and plant, your body starts to rotate just like it does in the shot and the discus and to a certain extent in the hammer. So if you've got a rotation horizontally when you hit your plant, if you're square to where you want to be to deliver when you plant, you're going to rotate down in the way, which is where you have a lot of problems with injuries and poor flight and not very much distance in the throw. I really like the idea of coming into the throw and when your left foot hits the ground for a right-handed thrower, your left side is firm in the direction of the throw and then stopping the forward momentum, then you rotate and deliver the javelin and you tend to stay nice and tall and square into the throw so that all your energy gets up into the javelin rather than being down there and falling away. So that's a real key point and that's the one thing that I really always base all my teaching and throwing on whether you're and the drills that you'll do it with in standing throws and a couple of steps all the effort is to work on attacking the throw horizontally, no up or down, everything moving horizontally where you want the jab wood to go, and the action of the right leg for right-handed thrower. When you land, to let this knee just give way so that the hips pass through into the solid left side, just let the knee give and the foot turn so that when the jolt hits, the hips naturally open up and drag the shoulder into a horizontal rotation and whip the shoulder through over the front leg. So on standing throws and throws off steps and even drills with medicine balls and things like that, you really don't want to teach a thrower to drive with the right leg and push with the right leg because that's going to make them start to stand up and teeter-totter or push themselves into that bucket again like we talked about down in here. The action of the right leg is really just to get out of the way and let the body maintain the backward lean and let the weight 
of the body hit this left side with no deceleration, moving as quickly as possible so this stop is as abrupt as possible and all the speed is channeled into the jab. In regard to the non-throwing arm, I like to think of pulling it in or getting it stopped wherever, wherever the action is, is really kind of up to the individual person. But I like to tell the thrower that when the right foot touches down after the crossover, the right foot that's landing and the crossover you're going to throw on, when that right foot touches the ground, start using the left arm to help move the body into the front leg, and it also keeps you from using it too late and pulls you into the bucket. If I use my right, my left arm when I land off the crossover, it blocks and it keeps my left side tall over the left foot, and then I'll rotate around it. If I use it too late and come in and use it when my left foot hits, then I'm going to increase the rotation away and falling off to the left. So start the left arm when the right foot touches the ground, so it's done when the left foot hits the ground. You're firm and tall, and everything goes into the jab. Uh, we're inside because I've got some carnival or something going on outside, so we'll be throwing a jab with a ball into the net against the wall just to demonstrate some of these things. And we'll start out doing some standing throws with a jab with a ball first. The thing I want to show is just some basic warm-up exercises using a medicine ball uh, to teach the action of this back leg being kind of passive and just letting body weight shift forward. The only bad thing we're going to have here is I'm left-handed, so you're going to have to reverse everything. You can see the idea, and if you can watch this and look at it in terms of throwing side and non-throwing side rather than left and right, it'll be helpful and you won't have to worry about interpolating right to left, etc. So, uh, just look at throwing side and not throwing side. I like to start out with some medicine ball work just to help stretch the shoulders and start to teach the weight shift from the lower body. And the action of that back leg is really passive and just kind of falling, giving way so everything moves forward. The idea being that hips move into the front leg, the hips being jolted to a stop initiates a stretch and an arch in the back and then that stretch reflex snaps the upper body forward into the throw. You're not throwing hard, you're trying to feel a stretch from the belly and a stretch in the stomach and up through the ribs as a result of sudden stop on the front leg. If you watch my back leg, you'll see that it never straightens and it stays supple and relaxed and lets the weight of my body move forward into the sudden jolt of the front leg. And the ball and the whip of the upper body is a result of the suddenness and the stopping of that front leg. After you do some of those, you can also do that with a couple of steps, which I'll do now also, to teach the rhythm of just letting that bottom leg flop. And that's a nice way to think of it, is the back leg flops so that you just keep plowing forward and you're hitting that front leg. A lot of, the, a lot of it is similar to the way you tell a pole vaulter to run into a vaulting pole. They jam the pole into the box horizontally and the pole lifts them up. The same thing you're doing here, you're sticking your plant horizontally and you're letting that jolt lift the body and the javelin up into the air. Everything that you want to try to teach your javelin thrower to do is apply force horizontally. The action of the legs, the action of the left arm or the right arm for a left-handed thrower like me, but for a right-handed thrower, the action of the left arm and the legs should be 
pretty close to parallel to the ground in a horizontal plane. The jolt and the body lean give you all the height. Teach a flying force in a horizontal plane, and you're going to run into very few problems. Again, on throws with a couple of steps, look at the action of the back leg, how it's very passive, and allows the hips and the center of gravity to move into the sudden stop, the bracing of the front side, and all the action is generating is downfield where you want the javelin to go. Nothing is up or down. Nice, smooth, easy rhythm. Now we got to chase the ball away. Everything is out and low. You won't see that back leg do any pushing. It just flops out of the way. Forward. You do the same thing when you start doing single arm throws. I'm using the ball inside just because it's easier for now. Uh, although with younger throwers, throwing something other than a javelin to learn position and feel and technique is often a good thing because you're not as concerned about flight and distance which young, inexperienced throwers usually are. They want to see how far they're throwing it. So when you're using the javelin, they're trying to throw far. If you teach them to throw into a net or throw the ball initially, they have to pay attention to doing it the right way. Same idea with single arm throws from a stand. We're working the timing now of back leg, block arm together so that you hit that Locking leg horizontally. Again, you're whipping. It's a reaction. For me, as a left-handed thrower, what I'm trying to do is get this three-quarters of my body from this line down, stabilized and anchored to let this part whip around that anchor and increase the speed and power getting into it. So I'm trying to hit firm here with this shoulder and arm well behind my hip, and then when everything is stable, shoulder and arm strike around and accelerate around that solid base. Again, from a standing throw, no push on the back leg. shot in the discus as you well know. It's just a different way, nice simple way of thinking about it with the jam. You can see I'm never bent over. I'm not dumping down and bailing away on the delivery. I don't look like a baseball pitcher. I'm up here nice and tall, and I'm following through and finishing up out chasing the implement. So all my power is going right into the implement that I'm throwing. Nothing is wasted. Uh, just watching this same standing throws, and then with a couple of steps from a different angle, head on, you can see how the non-throwing side is generally going to be blocked facing the direction of the throw, and then I'll square up around. First with standing throws.
Same thing with standing throws that we did with the ball, however. That leg does nothing. Timing of the back leg flop and the front arm lock simultaneous. Work that quickness of those two to drag this behind. Son needs some repair work in here. I tried to get up there and do it. It's a little too much for me. I hung it originally. I'll let him fix it. Again, the timing. This is really simple stuff if you keep in mind the concept of hitting the solid anchor and letting this accelerate around the anchor it makes it very simple, easy to teach, easy to see the correct movements. And then off of a couple of steps, again like we did with the ball, you see the change in body position and how well it's applied to the jack. Back leg, front arm together, nice and solid, so that you're up tall, striking, while the plant is standing you up into the throw. Oops. A little too much hand speed on that one. We'll be right back. show you some drills for crossovers and runway work. Again, on this one, I'm going to make a real effort on this final throw to achieve this kind of position where I'm locked and solid on the front side and I'm dragging the shoulder from as far behind as possible so it's up tall and through. on that one. I obviously did what I was talking about. Or I couldn't throw a good canvas like that. Okay, we'll do some drills in a second. Training uh, of your throwers with the javelin, especially the younger ones, is a couple of different kinds of crossover drills. One for the throwing side leg, which is primarily to emphasize getting it explosively off the ground and sweeping it in front of you to get the body of backward lean. So the action of the, of the throwing side leg forward and low and very quick to give you a backward lean, that's the first one that I'm going to show you, is just doing them in series, putting the emphasis on jumping horizontally off of the plant leg and thrusting the throwing leg forward, low and aggressive to increase body lean. So look at that scissoring action, the quick long jump action off of the plant leg, and the sweeping backward lean is resulting from the throwing side leg in the crossovers. You can see that all the action during that run is keeping the feet low to the ground. There's not a lot of vertical action. All the action is horizontal. Getting your feet out in front of you, 
sweeping your lower body ahead of your upper body to give a backward lean to essentially run away from your throwing shoulder. Once again, and you will see the more of these I do as I build up momentum, the tempo and the quickness of every successive crossover increases. It's only natural. I have more momentum. I have to move my feet faster as I do more of them to maintain the body position. It's another thing that you have to teach these the throwers is that is the more they do in sequence, they have to keep moving their feet quicker to maintain the same relationship of the feet in front and the backward lean of the body as a result of the feet running away. Not by pushing the shoulders back, by letting the lower body run away from the upper body. Yeah, that was, those are crossovers for teaching, to drill for teaching the throwing crossover. The one that you're going to actually land and deliver the javelin off of. Another part of the run-up and crossovers that's often overlooked are the two steps prior to the one that we just worked on. I call these the X's. This is where you're actually working on getting aggressively to the position that you're going to deliver the crossover that you're going to throw off of from. So on those previous crossovers, we worked on this aggressive low sweep and this horizontal jumping. What we're going to do now is work on the aggressive extension of the crossover leg to jump quickly onto the plant leg so that you have this aggressive horizontal movement so then you can jump into the throwing crossover that we worked on before. So on these, what you're actually going to see is the emphasis is on being stretched out in this type of position off of the back leg, aggressive and horizontal, and striding forward onto this front leg so that from this very quick dynamic position, you could explode into your throwing crossover. We don't actually do the throwing crossover in this drill. We work on the X's and the extension. Always working on lightness and quickness in the feet, not power and strength. Working with momentum so that you stay light, quick, and horizontal. These are very good for teaching young athletes to be relaxed and comfortable running with the javelin and getting the rhythm and the sense of working their body, especially their leg action, horizontal, parallel to the ground. You never see any up or down, any roller coaster action when I'm doing these. Everything is out. And obviously, the next step would be to put both of them together into runway drills, and then ultimately putting it together and delivering the jab. We'll try to do one now, just putting the two together without a delivery. As I do these, pay attention to how very easy it is for me to achieve this low sweep and backward lean in throwing crossover because of how nicely I've attacked and horizontally moved through my X. If you have a good aggressive horizontal X, 
The throwing crossover is very easy and natural to achieve, and it puts you in a great position to deliver the jab. There. Now here we see some training throws by Tom Puxtis, the American record holder. In this series of throws, Tom is especially working on the action of his right leg and left arm together so that they form the base of that pyramid or triangle that we've talked about and dragging the point of it. He's really making an effort to get his right hip ahead of his right shoulder and stabilize all of his body except for whipping his right shoulder and javelin around that base to accelerate it. You'll see how nice and firm he keeps his left side. He keeps his chest up and he delivers the javelin around a real solid base on his left side. And all the effort on these short approach throws is to get into the left quickly, hold it firmly, and let the jolt of that left side accelerate the throw and shoulder and the javelin, which he's doing very well through here on all these throws. Tom is also one of the best in the world at keeping control of the javelin throwing through the point. Uh, you can see from the positions that he's achieving on these throws, and you'll be able to see it from this angle as well, how cleanly he is in delivering the javelin. This is also a real good side, a real good angle for you to see how that left side stays solid. His left shoulder stays pretty much over his left foot until the javelin is out of his hand. And that idea of uh, thinking of the left side as a hinge, hitting it sideways, and letting the right side, which is the door, slam around the hinge. Right there. This is Linda Lipson, 97 US champion, essentially working on the same thing, getting quickly into the left side, holding it firmly and accelerating the shoulder around it. When you're taking these short approach throws, working on the rhythm and the tempo so that the quickest part is the ending is also very important. Here you see Rob Curtis, eighth in U.S. history with a best of over 265 feet, working on that in his practices. You can see how the tempo accelerates into the end, getting the left foot down quickly, and again, the jolt accelerating the throwing shoulder. Now these are throws about 75-80% of maximum off a full approach run to again work on the tempo and the acceleration into the end. So the sudden jolt of the plant is what accelerates and starts the javelin moving. Again, we have some more long approach throws by Tom Puxtis, working on the tempo and rhythm of his full approach into the throw. This is Andreas Linden from Germany. Uh, he is training in, with Boris Henry at this time. Uh, again, these are throws off the full competitive run-up, the full-length run-up, working on the tempo and the acceleration into the end. Um, these are throws at about 80% of maximum in terms of speed on the runway, 80 to 85%. And these throws by Linden are in the 260-foot range to 265. Uh, some of these throws by Boris Henry here are in excess of 280 feet. And the last throw of the workout that Henry has is with a women's javelin that's over 345 feet. It hit the fence at the end of the field, so we had to estimate how far it was. But the fence itself was at 336 feet. Nine.
500. In order to understand what mistakes we're about to look at, first we have to look at a couple of very good throws, here by Tom Puxtis and later by Boris Henry, of just some good sound technical throws, how the approach rhythm is smooth and the acceleration is consistent into the crossover steps and then into the sudden jolt of the plant. You'll notice as we come into these throws how the action of the right leg is soft and passive and allows the body to move forward into a solid left side and that jolt of the left side is where the reaction and the start of the throw comes from. One of the big problems that we'll see as we look at some other throwers making the mistakes is how poorly they use the right leg. If you feel the right leg working during the throw, then you're making a big mistake. The action of the right leg is very passive but active at the same time. It's active in getting out of the way so that the hips can continue to move forward into the throw as we see here into a solid jolt of the left side and that firmness accelerates the javelin and the throw is delivered straight through the point as you see here. Notice how firm the left side is all the way through the delivery and how everything, the attitude of the throw is out as we see here. Everything down the runway and in the proposed direction of the throw, there is a minimum of up and down action during the throw when it's done correctly. As we'll see here by Boris Henry on a throw of over 280 feet in practice, how quick and low the action of the legs is, exclusively forward, and the delivery of the javelin is very out in front, very quick, very clean, working aggressively around the solid left side of the throw. Again, same throw. Notice how quick the rhythm of the feet is, how the body is nice and upright. The action of the legs is out in front and moving parallel to the ground. The aggressive use of the left leg and the right leg together to get a backward lean, but notice the point of the javelin, the control of the javelin close to the body, parallel with the shoulders. The right leg gets out of the way, lets the body shift forward quickly into a sudden left side. That jolt stretches the body, and then from that stretch reflex, the javelin is accelerated and delivered. That's the way you're supposed to throw. That's what we're looking to do. Uh, what we'll see on some of these throws that follow are some common mistakes and some of the reasoning behind it. Uh, they can all come pretty much back to the same problems. Um, that was that 345 foot throw with the 600 gram javelin. And again, because this is so light and he is obviously a big powerful athlete and this is at the end of a workout, he had to be extremely clean technically in order to throw straight to the point, get nice flight and speed out of this javelin that you can see right here, there's not much wrong. There's very little that you can find wrong with that throw. Throwing a javelin that's meant to fly no more than 260 feet, another 80 feet more, you're doing a whole lot right. Uh, this is a similar throw from a different angle so that you can see how the firmness of the left side and the acceleration of the right side around it is a basis for getting speed into the javelin. Uh, you can basically think about just getting down the runway and sticking your left side sideways, which you can see here. The body doesn't open up until the jolt of the plant opens it and squares it to the throw. Again, we're looking at these throws to determine what's correct so we have a standard to measure the following throws uh, that are not so good. see the positions here, the feet are out in front, the shoulders are behind. You can see the flopping action, how the heel comes up off the right foot and the body shifts into the left side nice and firm and then that firmness accelerates the right side and the speed is delivered into the javelin through the point. Nice and clean, nice and solid. 
Now here we see one of the consequences of landing too hard on the right leg is that the hand drops, the forward speed is reduced, and the javelin point is lost so that you tend to get a throw that stalls, the nose goes up, the tail is pulled down. Because of a hard landing on the right leg, you lose speed moving forward because the right leg acts like the plant. You can see that gathering, the arm drops, the point is lost, there's no real aggressiveness into the left side, and the throw is kind of piking and falling away. You can see from the height of the javelin already and the angle that it's leaving at, that's a very ineffective delivery because of the action of the right leg. The right leg should make no noise when it lands off the crossover. A lot of times you can just listen to a throw and you can hear a loud right foot instead of a loud left foot. Uh, same problem. Uh, also notice the real high knee action of this thrower that tends to make the hips go up and down so there's a settling here when they land from the crossover. Again, the hand drops, the point goes up, and the javelin is delivered much too high and the pull on the javelin is much shorter than it could be. Again, same throw, up and down action, so that when you come down from the crossover, instead of that knee giving way to allow you to move forward, it absorbs and settles the body, so you have to literally push to get into the left leg. That drops the arm, raises the point of the javelin, and you can see the action of the throw is now up over the left leg instead of actively attacking horizontally into it. And you can see at normal speed how that right leg stops and there's no aggressiveness into the plant. It absorbs all the speed, the body stops moving, and you teeter-totter or rock into the throw, and you can just see the change in the alignment of the javelin from one step to the next, how it all goes up instead of out. Here's another consequence of ineffective right leg action where the body sits way too long on it. You can see how long the right heel stays on the ground and as a consequence again speed is lost moving forward and the body rotates way off to the left. It's almost a discus style delivery because that right leg holds the body weight and trying to be aggressive with the left side you drift off to the left and you fall away from the throw. That right leg should have sunk much earlier and as a consequence that right heel stays on the ground a while and some of these frame by frames the positions may look pretty good. The fact that there's no speed into the left leg, there's nothing for the left leg to stop, so there's no acceleration into the javelin, uh, becomes very obvious. Another problem that occurs very commonly is a lack of rhythm in the throw. You can see on that throw there was no real acceleration, there was no aggressiveness in the throw, everything is kind of one speed and as a consequence there's not a lot of speed from the run-up delivered into the javelin so you're basically throwing with only your upper body and arm you get no use out of the legs and hips into the throw another rhythm problem is too fast too soon as we can see here the thrower is going so fast he's literally out of control and gets a very short pull on the javelin uh, same thrower different angle you can see the consequences of going too fast you can't ever hit position and all that energy that's sending him tumbling down the runway never gets into the javelin where it needs to be. And the athlete tends to be very tall. You don't get any of the contortion and stretch reflex. Again, it's very, even though there's a lot of speed on the runway, it's not very well aligned. Here a different thrower has a problem that we saw earlier with a high knee action, very tall up over the top during the delivery instead of through the left leg He's stepping down and falling down, and as a consequence, the point goes up and the javelin goes way up in the air while he's falling down, instead of everything going through the point and the energy of the run-up going into it. Uh, Steve Backley, with something that has caused him a problem, as you can see, the bandage on his knee, or excuse me, on his elbow, he has a lot of difficulty holding that left leg firm during the delivery, so that folding front leg makes him pike forward and his elbow takes all the strain of these throws rather than it being in the big muscles in the legs and back. This is something that he's had a problem with over years and his style of throwing is really not a technique that I like very much. Here's another uh, athlete, Kimo Kinanen from Finland, who again has some problems with rhythm on the run-up, uh, too fast, too early, so he has to slow down and lose his position. 
Uh, again, here's Raymond Hex from Germany with a great throw to show what you're supposed to do running into that front leg using the jolt to accelerate the javelin and contort the body. There's a good rhythm and acceleration into the throw and good relaxation. Nice soft action of the right leg so that he sinks and almost falls into the plant. But everything that he's doing is moving horizontal to the ground, out parallel, really attacking the direction of the throw and attacking the plant. He's obviously happy with that. As we look at the differences in throwers, here's Tapio Corjas demonstrating fairly typical finish technique of getting uh, the left leg down quickly, dragging the throwing shoulder and arm. Uh, very similar to that idea of sticking the base of the triangle ahead of the point, as we talked about earlier in this video. Very quick dropping the right leg out of the way and getting the belly out in front of the throw almost can be described as throwing from the belly or throwing from the stomach. Uh, again, this is fairly typical of a lot of Finnish throwers. Uh, the tradition over the decades of their throwers has been to emulate a basic technique that he demonstrates. Here is Jan Zalesny, the current world record holder, uh, early in his career, 1988 Olympic Games. But you can see he is a bit more rotational, puts the javelin more out of line of the throw, wraps up, as they say, uh, but is very quick in the delivery of his feet into the plant, uh, really relies on a very sudden breaking action of his left leg to really put a tremendous acceleration into his throwing arm and ultimately into the javelin. Later in his career, he was able to catch the javelin and start accelerating it even further behind him, which led to even greater distances in his throws. Uh, Separatu, another Finn, uh, again, demonstrates the typical technique of getting the hips and the left shoulder way out in front of the right shoulder, getting a big stretch across the belly and chest, dragging the arm. Uh, he is a bit more powerful and tends to use a little bit more upper body into the throw. Uh, and as he has gotten older, he has relied on that a little bit more. But still, very nice technique. The emphasis on getting to the left leg firm and early and whipping the throwing arm around that solid base. Regardless of the technique that these throwers use, they all do basically the same things to throw far. Get to the left side very early, hold it very firmly, have a long accelerated pull on the javelin from a quick run-up. You can see here with Zelezny, there's a very, very firm left leg. The javelin is way behind him. Uh, he does tend to pike over a little bit on his delivery, but he has so much speed and he starts to throw from so far back, he gets a great deal of velocity into the javelin, thus a lot of distance. You can see very quick rhythm of the feet. The action of the right leg is very quick and early in the rotation so that he carries no weight on it at all. He's really screaming into his left leg when he hits that throw, and everything really gets transferred into the javelin very nicely. You can see these guys tend to plant only about four or five feet away from the foul line, and they don't generally foul on a good throw simply because they channel all of the momentum into the javelin. Another different angle of the same throw, you can see how firmly he holds that left side on the throw. Here's the winning throw at the 88 games. Again, Korhus from Finland. You'll see on this throw compared to his first throw, he's much firmer earlier on that left leg. It's almost locked out completely, and thus a lot more of his momentum gets transferred into the javelin. The more that front leg tends to bend, the less power is going to transfer efficiently into the javelin, simply because that initial shock absorbing action of that left leg bending is going to take speed away and absorb momentum and are going to stand you up before the jolt can start to apply that power into the javelin and transfer through the body and up into the shaft of the javelin. Watch how firmly this left leg is planted. Boom! And as a result, he catches the javelin on a flatter trajectory. It flies much more like an old rules javelin at the peak of the flight, and it results in his winning throw. Petra Felke, formerly of East Germany, uh, also at the 88 Olympics with a throw in excess of 235 feet, uh, typifies very sound basic mechanics, maybe no great style points, 
but doing the basic things to throw the javelin far. Accelerating into the throw, a quick drop of the right knee, a real firm left side, and a real long pull on the javelin. Again, you can see how efficient these throwers are. There's very little wasted energy. There's very little need for a big follow through simply because everything that they're doing is channeled into the javelin. Look at how firmly and quickly the left side locks down here. Very solid, very quick, so that there's a long, long path accelerating the javelin. You can't start pulling on the javelin and channel the power effectively till that left shoulder is firm along with the left leg. You have to think of planting from the left heel to the left shoulder. Fatima Whitbread of England, the first woman to throw over 250 feet, uh, a different style of throwing, very powerful, tends to throw more from the chest and the upper body, as you'll see later with Backley, where the stress is not down in the hips and the belly, but more up into the upper chest. And as a result, the hips tend to stay fairly square during the throw, while the British throwers using this technique have had a great deal of success. I tend to not like it very much simply because there's very little margin for error. You tend to not use your hips as well as you could here, you see Backley. And the tendency to fall off to the left, which can ultimately lead to a lot of elbow and shoulder injuries, um, is quite prevalent. Here you see a throw by Backley of over 90 meters. Uh, again, you can see how square he keeps his hips and shoulders as he comes in on the throw. Another one following up. Very high knee action, very quick, very quick delivery because everything is square up. It requires very split second timing. There's very little margin for error in this style of throwing. But obviously, there's been some success with he and Mick Hill and Whitbread. Uh, that English school of throwers uses that hip square, shoulders fairly square technique of throwing uh, and have had a great deal of success with it. Unfortunately, they've also had their fair share of injuries. That throw, you can really see how the chest is lunged forward in the throw. Uh, the center of stress in the body is not down in the hips and belly. Uh, another throw by Zelezny, uh, you can say he really got into that one. That was one of his many world records there. He is so quick in hitting that left leg and he generates so much power as a result of that sudden block. On this particular throw, he literally can't recover fast enough to get his right leg around, so he simply flops on the ground, reminiscent of Al Cantello in the 50s. Huge throw. For a guy who's barely six feet tall and 185 pounds, if that, he throws tremendous distances. Uh, here's Raymond Heck. We'd seen this throw earlier. Uh, again, a very solid technician in terms of accelerating into the plant, using that to contort his body. He tends to dump his left shoulder outside his left foot, similar to what uh, Zelezny does, but because he's bigger and stronger, it's a little bit more pronounced. He tends to pull his throwing shoulder almost between his feet in an effort to get it over his left foot. Uh, Incredibly powerful. I had the opportunity to see him throw in training and spent some time with him this year uh, when he was visiting the States in training. Incredibly powerful athlete who, when he lines it up, can really whack some big throws. Here's another throw by Hecht. Uh, this one in the 286, 87 foot range. The one previously was over 306 feet. You can see how quickly he pulls that left arm in. When the right foot touches the ground, the left arm is starting to be active in order to stabilize the left side of the body so that that energy transferred from the plant goes right into the throw and shoulder and then into the javelin. From this angle, you can see how he kind of dumps off to the left a little bit with that shoulder in an effort to pull that throwing arm as close to over his left foot as possible. Some of the older throwers or coaches may remember Nicholas Namath through similar to that. Here's Tom Puxtis with a great throw over 280 feet. He's obviously quite happy with that. Uh, Tom doesn't do anything spectacular technically, but he's very solid. Uh, he does all the good basic things, and he works to his strengths, which are he has an extremely powerful throwing arm, great timing through the point of the javelin in his delivery, so he has a very clean flight. 
Uh, he could block his left arm a little bit earlier and drop his right knee a little earlier, something that he's been working on lately. But even still, he carries all his momentum into a real firm left side and really accelerates his shoulder so that when he hits it with his arm, he can really add some speed to it. Here's Trini Hadestat on her winning throw at the World Championships in 1997, a throw in excess of 227 feet. Uh, again, nothing really spectacular or artistic about it, just good, solid, basic mechanics. Quick down the runway, very explosive, very powerful, and you'll notice from this angle how quickly she gets off of her right leg when she lands from a throwing crossover. Left foot's already out in front waiting to plant, and this right leg action essentially plants for her. Left side is solid, a delivery somewhat like Raymond Hecht has, very fast, very explosive, and again, everything gets into the javelin. Joanna Stone from Australia, also with a throw over 225 feet, uh, silver medalist at the 97 World Championships. She's a very tall, lean athlete and takes advantage of her leverage by also getting to her left side block very early and is very solid in anchoring her left side to really get a long whip and a long pull on the javelin as she comes into her delivery. You can see she has a nice alignment of the javelin with her shoulders. She also is very quick getting the right leg around, posts up very nicely on the left side, and very, very fast delivery, very full extension, really, really nice, basic, solid technique. Everybody that you're seeing on here, there's a shot of how to start from the side. Uh, all of these people are basically doing the same things, but they're finding their own personal ways suited to their physical capabilities to deliver the javelin. Here's Stone also from a side view, so you can see the length of the pull. Tends to carry the javelin a little bit low, but keeps her shoulders lined up with the shaft of the javelin and sticks it really nicely on the left side. Gets a long, fast pull. Here's one of the fins, again very typical and dragging the shoulder as you hit the block. As we look at some very specific flexibility exercises for the shoulders, upper back, and hips as warm-ups, uh, we'll talk a little bit about weight training and conditioning. Uh, the thing that you need to remember is that all this supplemental training is designed to help you throw the javelin farther. We talked about that earlier and the traps that you can get caught up in by trying to get too strong, uh, etc. What you're really trying to do is find your weak areas physically and technically and improve them. Uh, weight training is by far the most effective way to increase your explosive strength and power, but you'll also see some uses of medicine balls, uh, of different shots that you can throw. But just understand that in a general training scheme of things, everything has got to be geared toward getting you to throw the javelin farther, getting a fast release speed so you can throw farther. In terms of training during the year or during the season, I generally like to think about uh, a three-stage approach a preliminary or conditioning stage where basically you work on improving at low intensity your throwing technique, finding the mistakes that you have in your technique and improving and correcting them by taking a lot of low intensity throws to work on making those mistakes uh, corrected and making that a stronger part of your throw and also some base conditioning. Uh, a high volume of moderate intensity running and also a high volume of moderate intensity lifting. Basically, your lifting should focus on improving the weaker parts of your body, but you also have to include the traditional um, basic power movements, cleans or snatches, um, squats, bench presses for the upper body, pullovers for the upper body, uh, and some specific rotation exercises for the trunk, whether it's with a plate and swinging, uh, throwing weighted balls or shots in different rotational situations to get the abdominals particularly strong. You generate the power from the throw out of your legs, which is why javelin throwers tend to do so much squatting, jumping, and sprinting work to have fast, powerful, explosive legs, and you have to have great flexibility, as you can see here in the arms and shoulders, so that you can pull the javelin over a long range, but you also have to have 
a very strong back abdominals and trunk so that the leg power generated can get into the upper body and be applied to the javelin. So in the fall or in the early part of the season with high school throwers, it may be the first three or four weeks of the season, you work on improving your technique, improving basic conditioning. You can see some standing throws that we're doing here to work on rotating the hips forward and dragging the shoulder. Again, specific flexibility. When you get into the middle part of the season or early throwing season for, the, for people with a short season, like high school athletes, you try to improve the explosive power and perfect your throwing technique. We're about to see now, here's some basic medicine ball work that you can do to strengthen the shoulders, trunk and back, and also increase the range of motion in the shoulders. You can see the throw initiates by a shift of the weight in the lower body, and then a stretch and snap in the stomach, chest, and then ultimately in the shoulders. These are the type of exercises that you would do to improve your explosive power in that second phase of the training cycle, whether it's um, the fourth or fifth week in the season uh, for the high school throwers or in the winter for the year-round trainer. Here we see Raymond Hecht uh, and we'll see a number of other javelin throwers doing a weight training circuit to emphasize explosive power. Now you have to understand these are some of the best athletes in the world. These guys have trained for a number of years just to get to the level of condition that allows them to do this type of training. This is not the stuff that you're going to have a high school sophomore do or somebody who's only been seriously training in the javelin or any throwing event for only two or three years. Uh, in this particular cycle, uh, what they're doing is training, actively doing the exercise for 20 seconds, and then a 20 second recovery. This is Tom Puxtis, the American record holder, who's also going through this training cycle. Um, and you can see how the emphasis is on being explosive and powerful. The whole thing that you're trying to do is be like a giant rubber band so that you can work that stretch reflex that you get from the plant and apply that speed into the javelin. You can see there's a real emphasis on working the abdominals in a lot of these exercises. And we're talking, you can see that none of these things are being done slowly. These are all quick movements because the javelin itself is a very quick, explosive, dynamic event. And you have to train specifically for it so that your body can be in condition to not get injured and it can also be used to moving quickly and explosively so that you can be aggressive in delivering the javelin and finding your throwing positions. You'll also see later on in this tape some specific um, shot throws that these German athletes do and a lot of athletes, I, I say the German specifically because these are the people that I spent time with and got to watch during their training. But really what you're seeing on this videotape in terms of the ideas of training, the throwing technique, is fairly typical of the great javelin throwers all around the world. Every group or every coach or every um, country may have some specific exercises that they tend to favor or that they like more than others. But basically they're trying to train the body to be very flexible, very explosive, very elastic, so that it's tough and can handle high explosive training without getting injured, and you also are conditioned to be able to be explosive and flexible so you can get in these great contorted positions in your javelin technique and then let the stretch reflex take over and apply all that speed directly into the javelin. Uh, the only other thing that I would really mention here is that there increasingly over the last couple of years has been a great deal of attention paid to the nutrition and um, vitamin and mineral supplements to help the body recover from these hard training sessions. Uh, specifically, uh, the use of magnesium, uh, phosphorus, and zinc are going to be helpful, uh, as well as potassium in getting the body to recover a little more easily from hard training sessions. But ultimately, you have to listen to your body. When you're sore and tired and wore out, that's not the time to try to train harder. It's time to rest and let your body heal up and recover so you can continue to train effectively and not get injured. Here you'll be able to see um, 
again, a number of these German athletes, Raymond Hecht giving me a free little promo here, uh, as well as Peter Blank, who is another German javelin thrower who has a best of close to 290 feet, doing a variety of shot throws for distance. This is an actual testing cycle that they do, three throws in about 11 different types, uh, where they measure the best, record them. Again, these give them a feedback and a level of explosive power. This is Peter Blank here. Uh, it gives them some feedback on their level of explosive power, and, ha and it's a gauge to measure how their training has been going through the season. Uh, while some of these exercises, the backward over the head throw and forward from a squat, are fairly traditional and a lot of throwing athletes will do them, you will also see a number of others here that they do that are somewhat bizarre. Uh, I would definitely not recommend them, uh, especially for young, inexperienced athletes. And some of these are, they almost look dangerous. What they're throwing here is a 16-pound shot with a handle. Uh, and they do all of the throws that you're going to see on here with a 16-pound shot. And these are all maximum effort. This is a highly competitive situation that these athletes are in. Uh, I will leave you on this note. Um, please feel free to contact me if you have any questions. Uh, I'm enclosing some printed material on weight training and the seasonal cycle in training for you. Uh, I hope this is helpful. Good throwing. Uh, and enjoy the rest of this little shot put competition. Ich 
Das ist gut. War nicht schlecht. Ja. <lacht> die Daumen. Oh, oh. Was für die Rede. <lacht> pass auf, hey, pass auf. <lacht> <lacht> There are two lifts that I want to show that uh, are not on the earlier part of the tape. These are two very specific lifts that are very productive in improving your javelin throw. One of them is a pullover. I like to do these off an incline bench where you not only do the pullover but also an extension. So you're doing a tricep extension as well as the pullover, being fairly explosive with it. And again, working through a full range of motion on those. The other exercise that's extremely beneficial are the type of trunk rotation. Uh, Yuri Sadiq showed me these. He prefers, and I agree with him, not to do trunk rotations with a bar on your shoulder. It puts too much stress on your back. And on these, very simply, the way he determined it, you stretch, work, in a low, high, low, and you work with gravity, down, down, work on the down swing, and also doing it up, work on the up, work on the up. Doing those, those are extremely event specific, but they will also help you improve your specific strength and power that will help add to the distance that you throw. These exercises incorporated with the other things that we talked about on the tape and on the handout that's enclosed with this video should help you go a long ways to improve your specific power and help you throw a lot farther. Good luck to you. Let me know if you have any questions or problems. Thanks again for your support of Club Key House by buying this videotape. Good luck to you. I'll be back.